Welcome to Let's Talk Micro. Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Micro. I hope you had a great week. As always, Let's Talk Micro is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Amazon Music, Pandora, The Get App, Good Pods. Basically, wherever you listen to your podcast, you can find Let's Talk Micro. I am also on Instagram as Let's Talk Micro no apostrophe, on Twitter as Let's Talk Micro 1, and on LinkedIn as Luis Plaza. So please go ahead and follow, subscribe to the podcast, download episodes, provide feedback, maybe any topic suggestions. Those are always welcome and appreciated. And I always like to post pictures of organisms, especially on Twitter and Instagram. And I like to provide updates as to when the next episode is coming out. So go ahead and check it out. So if you haven't checked out the previous episode, go ahead and do so. You know, I finished talking about media and assumptions that you should not do when you are working cultures in the lab. So remember on the first episode, I started with PEA. How great PEA is for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. You know, I talked about the morphology of PEA. And I definitely mentioned that, you know, when I say morphology of PEA, how Enterococcus fecalis looks beta hemolytic. So I also spoke about how sometimes, and this has been especially true with the pandemic, that we experience supply shortages. You know, we have our media's back order, the same with reagents. So we might need to isolate an organism, and we might not have the tools we need to do so. And I mentioned like PEA. So in situations like this, you know, we use the knowledge we have about susceptibilities and media, and we implement that to our work to try to isolate these organisms, right? So I talked about limb broth and how we can use that to try to isolate gram-positive cocci. I mentioned myroides and how difficult it can be to isolate, to isolate it sometimes. So I mentioned modify Thayer Martin and Martin Lewis that can be helpful to isolate it. You know, one of the ingredients is trimethoprim that will inhibit the swarming of the proteus. That, you know, that can help. Since I mentioned that, you know, myroides and proteus, a lot of times they're together. So it's kind of hard to separate, at, at least the myroides. It's very hard to separate it. So that's where modified Thayer Martin and Martin Lewis come into play. So go ahead and check out that episode. And I also talked about the situation with the Stenotrophomonas and the Pseudomonas aeruginosa. You know, that was definitely my favorite. You know, when I saw that Steno growing and the PSA, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, pushed back. And I have to say that was pretty cool. And always, you know, keep in mind that this is serious for the patients. So when I mention that something is cool, it's from the point of view of the technologist, that we get to learn something new that is going to end, is going to make us stronger in our jobs. And then the next time we can apply that knowledge when we encounter that situation and we are able to isolate that organism, proper susceptibility testing can be done and the patient gets the proper treatment. So remember that. I always like to say that just in case, you know, I mentioned cool, this is cool, but you know, it's always good when we learn things that makes us better at our jobs. So go ahead and check out that episode if you haven't. Great episode, episode 52. So on today's episode, I want to go over Enterococcus. So Enterococcus is a gram-positive cocci in pairs and chains. It was previously classified as a strep, but as the molecular field makes advances, you know, we discovered that some organisms have enough differences to others that can place them in their own group. And those of you that work in micro, uh, you know, some of the older texts, you know, they say and it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but at the same time, it's kind of not, not that they used to say, you know, that everything was called Pseudomonas. You know, you had Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Pseudomonas sepatia, uh, Pseudomonas maltophilia. And as more testing is done, the species, you know, started being separated. So now we have Porcaldaria, we have Stenotrophomonas. So the same with this, you know, before it used to be part of the strip. And now it is its own, its own category. So Enterococcus, it has its own group. So Enterococcus is the colonizer of the gastrointestinal tract. It is definitely predominant in this area, 
and it is also found in the oral tract, female genital tract, and skin. They are commonly seen in polymicrobial infections. And remember, like in several episodes, I always talk about this mix infections where you have several organisms. And it is very typical to see, you know, sometimes some of these infections see two or three enterobacteriales, some non-fermenters. And enterococcus, almost always, it's involved in that mix. So when, when the textbooks say that enterococcus is, you know, it's seen in polymicrobial infections, that is a definite fact. A lot of times when you see it, it's mixed with other organisms. So enterococcus is seen in urinary tract infections or UTIs, bacteremia, endocarditis, and soft tissue infections. And this is an interesting fact. Uh, you know, they are considered one of the leading causes of UTIs of, or urinary tract infections and bacteremia in the United States. Most infections are nosocomial and include the ones that I just mentioned. It is transmitted from person to person contact and also contact with contaminated surfaces. You know, nosocomial, we keep hearing nosocomial infections, hospital acquire, and those of you that work in the hospital, you know how important it is to wash your hands, you know, change gloves between patients, and, you know, washing your hands, washing your hands and doing it, so, you know, doing it properly. And be careful, especially now in this era where the phones have made such a great advance and pretty much all of us have one and we're always looking at it. Make sure you clean that. You definitely know enough. And if you work in micro, you know a lot about organisms and you know that a lot of these organisms, they definitely survive in hospital equipment. So the cleaning and disinfection of these is very important. And if you touch any of this equipment, make sure you wash your hands properly. That's very important. Always you know, decontaminate your surfaces and wash your hands. There are many species of Enterococcus, uh, the most common and clinically significant being Enterococcus faecalis and Enterococcus facium. And then other species encounter are Enterococcus gallinarum, Cassiflavus, Raphinosus, and avium, avium, among others. So there are many more of these, but however, after faecalis and facium, avium, gallinarum, Cassiflavus, and raffinosis, those are the ones that you will see the most. So let's go ahead and start with morphology. So like I said, this is a gram-positive cocci in pairs and chains. It is catalase negative. And let's go ahead and talk about catalase for a moment. You know, when it comes to catalase and enterococcus, I always like to take a, take a minute and talk about it. Because it is catalase negative, but however, it has what textbooks describe as a weak positive or delayed reaction. And what's this? Well, when you touch the colonies, when the colonies become in, in contact with the catalase reagent, maybe after a second or so, you see some tiny bubbles. And this is considered a negative reaction. Whereas when you have organisms like staph, you know, like staph aureus, the colonies come in contact with the catalase and you see an immediate and very strong reaction. And that's a positive. So make sure you keep that in mind. And I like to stress this out to the students because when they are taking some sort of practical test and or they're working on unknown and they see the colonies, they go ahead and do a catalase, they see the tiny bubbles and then they, they think it's positive and then they start working it as if it was to say a staff. And that is wrong. So, you know, with the reactions always commit what the colonies look like to mind. That way, even if you get that weak, questionable reaction, you're like, wait a minute, something is not right here. You know, I like to talk about colony morphology. The staff colonies are always large, flat. Strep colonies and enterococcus colonies, you know, they are small and raised. So that's something to keep in mind. That way, when a reaction goes wrong or you have a questionable result, you know that something is off. But I have seen this with students where they work it up and then they end up saying that their unknown was a, a coagulase negative staff because they had that catalyst reaction and they call it positive. So students, 
please remember this. That type of reaction is actually a negative reaction. So now that we know that it's catalyst negative, what's the next test? So it is the PYR. Do you remember the PYR? Well, if you don't, if you need a refresher, go ahead and check out episode 7 of this podcast. I go over in detail about the PYR test. But those of you that work in micro, you know, you know the PYR test and it is positive for enterococcus. Very simple test, right? So, and always remember that as far as strep and enterococcus goes, streptococcus pyogenes is PYR positive. So these are the only two that are positive. Streptococcus pyogenes and enterococcus PYR positive. So it is a very simple test, you know, um, very simple to set up, you know, in a couple of minutes you get a result. So, but nowadays, you know, with the Vitec and the Molotov, you know, this is pretty much what, you know, technologists do in the lab. They probably put it, you know, through the Molotov. So you don't do the PYR test that much, you know, because you identify your colonies via the use of Molotov. If you don't have a Molotov, then you definitely use the PYR as a, you know, as your as part of your differential when you're working up the colonies, and you will set up the ID via Vitek or another method. But yeah, as you know, with the Molotov, a lot of the biochemicals are not being done anymore. You know, I don't like this, but that's a conversation for another day. So let's go ahead and talk about morphology. Well, like I mentioned. You know, the colonies are raised and small, unlike staph that are large and flat. So, Enterococcus faecalis is gamma hemolytic. Some strains are actually beta hemolytic. So, you might have, sometimes, you know, you might find yourself in a situation where you have a beta hemolytic colony and you're doing your PYR and it's positive, and then you're, you're typing and it's negative. And you're like, wait a minute, especially if you're like a brand new tech, you know, very or a student, you might be confused because you're like, well, it's PYR positive, but it's not typing. It's like, what do I do? So it's always good to keep in mind that some strains of Enterococcus faecalis are beta hemolytic. And I like to repeat the fact that don't confuse this beta hemolysis with the fact that some species of Enterococcus faecalis, they will look beta hemolytic on PEA. The ones that I'm talking about that are true beta hemolytic, you will see it on the blood agar plate, which is the plate that you use to determine hemolysis. And I mentioned that you should not use PEA to determine hemolysis, and you also shouldn't use it to type. So this is very important when you're getting to do a strep typing, make sure that the blood plate is the blood agar plate. You can actually get false results if you attempt typing from the PEA, and I have seen this. And then the other, the other clinically significant species, you know, the other one that's seen the most, it's Enterococcus facium, like I said, and it is alpha hemolytic. However, keep in mind that when I say alpha hemolysis, it is not like the type of hemolysis that you will see in, let's say, strep pneumo, or maybe the virulent strep where you see, you know, the whole agar green, the morphology, the alpha hemolysis for Enterococcus facium is that you see the colonies are gray and then you have like an alpha halo around them. So always keep that in mind. To me, it just looks like fecalis, but with a little halo on it, a little alpha halo. So that's a good way to keep it in mind. But just remember that, yes, that the, the, the hemolysis is not the same as you will see on strep viridans or a streptococcus pneumoniae. So now you know, catalyst negative, PYR positive, alpha hemolytic for enterococcus facium, and gamma hemolytic for enterococcus faecalis. So let's go ahead and talk about media. Well, you know, enterococcus, and before I do that, let me mention that all the other species that I mentioned, they are typically alpha hemolytic as well. So let's talk about media. It grows well on blood, chocolate, and PEA. It is a facultative anaerobe. So it will grow on an anaerobic blood agar plate or a CDC agar. And you get a, a good recovery from your basic agar. You know, they're pretty good. I like to call them team players when it comes to making suspensions 
four susceptibilities, you know, for that McFarlane, that 0.5, for it, you know, for them being smaller colonies, you don't need that many to get that nice 0.5 suspension. So as far as identifying it, methods like the Vitek, Molotov, and Micros can work. You know, they will identify it with a high confidence rate. And there are some kits that can provide you an identification with about four hours, but they tend to be subjective. I don't, I'm not a fan of them. I know that they tend to be cost effective, especially for smaller facilities and that you don't have a high volume. Maybe you don't have the capacity to store a lot of, of supplies. So they tend to work, yes, but sometimes, you know, those reactions, you're calling them a positive or a negative. And then if you're unsure, maybe you put a, a star on it, maybe change the results. So you kind of, in a way, I are kind of like tailoring the results a little bit to get what you need. So I'm not really a fan of that. So it is definitely best if you have a Vitek, a, you know, a Molotov, a Microscan. It is definitely best if you identify them by those methods. And of course, you know, nucleic and PCR methods such as the Luminex, you know, BioFire and Eplex, they will identify fecalis and phasium. And you know, these methods are typically used for blood cultures. And some of them will even detect genes that confer resistance for vancomycin, such as Van A and Van B. And I will talk more about those. So I mentioned that, you know, Enterococcus, more specifically, fecalis and phasium are frequently seen in nosocomial infections. So of course, nosocomial being hospital acquired. So these organisms, they affect hospitalized patients and patients that are immunosuppressed. It is a colonizer of the GI tract. So one of the main concerns is that some strains have acquired a resistance to vancomycin. And vancomycin is a glycopeptide that targets the cell wall of gram-positive bacteria. For the time being, let's just leave it at that. At some point in time in the podcast, I will talk about antibiotics, but for now, just know the basic definition of what vancomycin is. So according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, in 2017, VRE, or vancomycin-resistant enterococcus, caused an estimated 54,500 infections in hospitalized patients and 5,400 estimated deaths in the U.S. And according to the ASM Manual of Clinical Microbiology, nine types of resistance to glyco glycopeptides have been described. And there are three that are the most common. Van A, Van B, and Van C. So throughout this episode on the next one, you'll hear me talking about Van A, Van, a, Van B, and Van C. So they are encoded by genes with the same name. So out of the three... Van C encodes for a low level resistant resistance, which is an MIC minimum inhibitory concentration of less than 32. Whereas Van A and Van B result in MICs greater than 32 micrograms per ml. Those are the units. And like I like to say, when you are looking at you know your minimal inhibitory concentrations, the Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute, you know, the CLSI M100. It's a you know, resource where all you know, the organisms are listed with the MICs as far as you know, susceptible, intermediate, resistance. So it is a great resource. You know, all the labs have it. And of course, you can always find it online. Just go Google or another search, search engine and type free CLSI N100 and you can find it there. So MIC is greater than 32 for Van A and Van B. And those of you that actually are, you know, doing working with the Vitek, you know, you see that one is greater than 32. The instrument flags it and say, you know, you have a VRE there, a vancomycin resistant enterococcus. So another fact is that enterococcus facium tends to be associated with VRE more than fecalis. And keep in mind that when you are reading a culture and you do a susceptibility, and you get a result that's a VRE, make sure you check your purity plate. Also check the patient's history. You know, a lot of times when you have, you know, like I mentioned, enterococcus is seen in mixed cultures. So if when you were setting up your suspension for your susceptibility, if you grab maybe some of that gram-negative RON 
or some of a yeast if you had it there, you might be having a false positive result. And when by false positive, I mean a false resistant result. So always make sure when you have VREs, make sure you check the purity plate. And for those of you that are fairly new to this profession or are studying, when you set up susceptibilities, you know, you make your suspension, you set up the susceptibility either by a manual or automated method. And especially when you're doing automated methods, you do a purity plate, which is basically you get a loop and you dip it in your solution and you streak a plate. And you just want to make sure that your suspension was not contaminated. So go ahead and check it out when you have a VRE. I like to say this because I have seen it, which sometimes, you know, like of new text, they call something VRE. And then you go to the plate and you see that there was a lot of yeast around or a lot of gram negatives around. And then when you investigate and check the purity plate, you see that it was mixed. So please be careful with this. Out of the other species that I mentioned, Enterococcus gallinarum and Cassiloflavus, they exhibit a low level of intrinsic resistance to vancomycin. And this is by the Van C gene. So typically when you have those in the lab and by a low level intrinsic resistance, it's about four to eight micrograms per ml. Whereas the other, you know, Fecatis and Facium, they are greater than 32. And those typically, when you have them, you release them, you know, you release the result with some sort of statement saying these two organisms, they exhibit a low level of intrinsic resistance to vancomycin. Infection control measures are not required. Something along those lines. So are there any methods to screen and isolate VREs? Yes, there are. And I will talk more about these on the next episode. And that, my dear audience, it's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed learning about Enterococcus, you know, and morphology, biochemicals, and everything. As always, I enjoy talking to you about all this information. Remember that always continue bringing that passion to what you do. So important. It will make you better at your job. And of course, continue educating yourselves. This is very important. So... As always, stay motivated, stay safe, and of course, continue talking micro. Until the next time, bye.